All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the uh, California Democratic Party's weekly prop talk. Uh, my name is Rusty Hicks. I'm chair of the California Democratic Party, and it's great to be here with uh, each and every one of you this, this evening. As we embark on the next 55 days, uh, probably the most important election of our lifetime. I know we hear that every single election, but I think this one's pretty important. Uh, what we have experienced over the last three weeks, three months, three years, really is a pandemic on top of a pandemic, on top of a pandemic. And on top of that, we have only seen the housing crisis in California uh, get significantly worse. And we have Proposition 21. That's an important part uh, of that solution, of making sure that every Californian has a roof over their head, access to quality, affordable, housing. Uh, and this evening, as part of our uh, prop talk, we've got the opportunity to hear from uh, some leaders, um, both within the California Democratic Party, but experts in the field uh, of, of housing to talk to us about the importance of the passage of, of Proposition 21. I know that um, everyone is dealing with uh, home life, work life, school life, political life, and it's a lot to juggle uh, at this point in time. And I really want to express our gratitude uh, for each and every one of you for joining uh, this, this conversation. Uh, I want to begin just by introducing our speakers this evening. First is uh, LA City Council member David Ryu, uh, who's been an outstanding leader uh, in this space. Uh, grateful to have him here with us. Uh, Larry Gross, who is the executive director of the Coalition for Economic Survival and a regional director of the California Democratic Party. We're grateful to have him with us. Uh, Taisha Brown, the chair of the CDP's Black Caucus, uh, a leader out of San Diego, a leader in the labor movement. We're glad to have her here with us. And of course, uh, Kevin DeLeon, uh, our former president pro tem uh, of the California State Senate, but also a council member elect in the city of Los Angeles. And our host and moderator, uh, Susie Shannon, which probably needs no introduction, but I'll introduce her uh, anyway. She's worked for more than 10 years uh, as a nonprofit executive uh, to provide solutions that fight homelessness uh, and poverty uh, in, in Los Angeles and across California. In 2015, she spearheaded legislation uh, that uh, placed California on a housing first model. Uh, for homelessness, which passed the legislature and was signed by the governor in, in 2016. Uh, she's been a senior advisor, campaign director, uh, labor consultant for more than 14 years on statewide and local campaigns throughout California. She's also a uh, DNC member, a, a delegate to the National Democratic um, Committee, as well as being an executive board member for the California Democratic Party. So I'm grateful uh, to have the opportunity to introduce Susie Shannon. Susie? Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, to Rusty Hicks for that great introduction. Um, I'm Susie Shannon. I'm also the policy director for the Proposition 21 campaign. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, these are like extraordinary times right now. and. Um, I think this is such an important election and the stakes are high. So as much as we can learn about the proposition, um, particularly Proposition 21, uh, the more helpful it's going to be for people to spread the word uh, to their family members and friends. Um, and I'm just very grateful to everyone, especially who is uh, finding today to care about the proposition. Um, proposition 21 is a homeless prevention and anti-gentrification initiative, and it actually um, will allow local governments the freedom to provide renter assistance um, to uh, our renters who are right now are struggling. Um, according to a recent um, um, project that was uh, put out by the Aspen Institute, there's four to five million people who will face eviction if immediate action isn't taken by the government uh, in the next few months. So. Um, this is a really important proposition. Um, I work with homeless and low-income communities. 
Um, this is, I think, the most important initiative for preventing homelessness. Um, and our panelists of experts uh, will be able to frame the issue um, very well, I think, uh, so that you will be able to leave here, hopefully, um, providing that information to friends and family and other voters. Um, and we're also asking for you to take action at the end of this. I'll explain what that is, but you know, to tweet out and to do uh, all kinds of um, important stuff would be great. So I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists one, one by one. Um, I'm going to bring on first Kevin DeLeon. Um, Kevin is um, the Senate pro tem emeritus, uh, former president of the California Senate. Um, he's also council member elect for CD14. Um, he also is the author uh, of the No Place Like Home uh, legislation, which became top two, which put $2.2 billion into homelessness. His district actually represents the homeless capital of the United States, which is Skid Row. Uh, so this is also a very important proposition for him. Um, so Kevin, you want to say hi? Well, first of all, uh, thank you so very much, uh, uh, Susie, for that wonderful introduction of my person to our, our chair of our, our party here in California. Uh, Rusty, thank you very much for your leadership to all the, the great panelists. But, to each and every one of you, to the incredible Democratic Party activists of the greatest state and the greatest country in the world. I want to thank you very much for your participation in tonight's event dealing with a very serious issue. Now, Susie just mentioned a few moments ago that these are, in fact, extraordinary times. And yes, they are. Uh, with the coronavirus, with the wildfires, uh, with the eviction moratoriums that are set to expire uh, in the immediate future, I can say that extraordinary times require extraordinary action. Uh, never have we seen collectively uh, the number of individuals uh, living in our streets, in our alleyways, in our parks, overpasses and underpasses, in cars that we have seen in our lifetime. This is being the fifth largest economy on planet Earth. This being the largest economy in the nation. And yet we see tens of thousands of individuals living in our streets and increasingly men and women. This is why extraordinary times calls for extraordinary leadership to make sure that we give elected officials up and down the state of California every available instrument tool to do everything within their power to make sure that we don't have families, to make sure that we don't have single mothers living on our streets. Uh, this is an opportunity to empower uh, local officials. Again, up and down the state of California, making sure that in a state like California, a state that values diversity and inclusivity, that politically that we stand up and we do the right thing, especially for people of color. Because quite frankly, what Susie said a few moments ago, if California, but especially Los Angeles, now if Los Angeles is the epicenter, of our homelessness nationwide, then the district that I am about to assume leadership in, Council District Number 14, is in fact ground zero for the entire nation when it comes to homelessness. And increasingly, I see people of color, men of color, and women of color, again, living in our streets. That's why we should provide them dignity and respect. This, this is this opportunity to make sure that we give our local officials up and down the state of California, that ability to make sure that we give them the roof over the head, the dignity and respect that they deserve. So with that, I want to thank you very much to all the incredible Democratic Party activists. Thank you, Susie, and I look forward to the panel. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was great. Um, okay, our next panelist is Taisha Brown. She is the chair of the California Democratic Party Black Caucus. Um, she is a force, uh, to be reckoned with um, and speaks all over um, the state of California uh, and does a lot of advocacy um, on behalf of low-income communities. Taisha, take it away. I first want to say yes on Proposition 21. I want to say thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. This uh, proposition is near and dear to my heart. Um, it's something I truly believe in and that's why I'm a part of 
saying yes on Proposition 21. As the Senator just said, extraordinary times calls for extraordinary actions. So I'm asking all of you as Democrats to join in with me and say yes on Prop 21 and also talk to your friends and family about it. As a homeowner and also a landlord, I will tell you I am all in for Proposition 21. We have many, 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 many people homeless. Um, as the Senator said, people of color, but I wanna be more specific, black people. Um, even though California has the fifth largest economy in the world, we're number one in homeless and that should not uh, be the case. And out of the number one, a little over 40% of those people are black people, black mothers, black fathers, their children, um, homeless, kids just sleeping out on the sidewalk. And I think it's a shame because we have the money and the resources within the state to ensure that we have homes for everyone. They found homes when uh, the pandemic came, they found hotels and places for these people to stay. And I truly believe that um, with the right people in office uh, leading this state, like our governor, um, we can heal California and heal this situation from homelessness. So again, please join me and the caucus, the Black Caucus has endorsed also Proposition 21. And thank you, I look forward to the conversation. That's fantastic, Taisha, thank you so much. Um, our next panelist is David Rue. Um, David is the council member for Council District 4 in Los Angeles. Um, before he became a council member, he actually worked at the intersection of healthcare and homelessness. Um, and we're very excited to have him here today. David? Thank you, Susie, um, for inviting me. And thank you to the California Democratic Party. Of course, our chair, Rusty Hicks, um, fellow uh, uh, colleague, future colleague, uh, uh, Senate Pro Temp, Kevin DeLeon, and um, of course, tenants' rights advocates, Larry Gross, and um, uh, Taisha Brown. Uh, it's such a privilege to be here to help talk about this very, very important measure, measure of Proposition 21. Because we know already in, in Los Angeles County alone, one in five households that are renters have lost their jobs. More and more people are spending more and more of their uh, limited amount of funds on rent. And we have over 120,000 households in LA County that it's at risk of becoming homeless. You know, we need to make sure that this passes because Prop 21 will fix the overreach of Costa Hawkins and give local cities like Los Angeles greater control over our housing policies that have life or death consequences. You know, with this pandemic before us, Prop 21 is needed like needed more than ever before. Even before the pandemic hit, we, were, we had such a divide between the haves and the have nots, and we are already in a housing and rental crisis. But because of the pandemic, um, this, this issue has exacerbated and skyrocketed. So we need Prop 21 because it's, it's not just gonna fix our housing crisis, but it's gonna solve, it's gonna prevent a homeless crisis and the poverty crisis that is looming before us. Because Prop 21 will allow us to expand rent control policies to protect millions across our state from displacement, even the playing field for renters and restore justice and sanity in our housing markets. So we just don't, be, as Democrats and part of the LA County Democratic Party, we shouldn't just vote for it, but we need to organize, educate and mobilize around Prop 21 because we have to pass Prop 21 like our homes depend on it. So thank you for inviting me. Great, thank you. Um, so our next panelist, uh, our fourth panelist and final panelist is another, none other than Larry Gross. Many of you may know him. He's the Region 12 Director for the California Democratic Party. What you may not know is that he's also the Executive Director of Coalition for Economic Survival, which is one of the most important and effective uh, nonprofits for um, tenants in uh, Los Angeles and also in state um, working on policy issues. So um, Larry, thank you so much for coming on and we're glad to have you. Yep, batting cleanup in the fourth spot. So, <laughs> th 
Thank you, Susie, for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. Uh, thank I, so I'm honored to be on this panel with my distinguished uh, co-panelists and uh, proud to be a uh, member and, and leader of the California Democratic uh, Party um, and here with our chair, Rusty Hicks. Um, so, so, you know, we keep referring to, to what we're facing as a housing crisis, but that really understates our situation. It's really a housing catastrophe of biblical proportions. Um, and people are, are suffering. Here in Los Angeles, we're a city of renters. 62% uh, of the people who live here are renters. And yet we're the most unaffordable US city as far as rent burden goes uh, on tenants. More than half of all LA renter households live in unaffordable housing, paying upwards of 30% of their income on housing. One in three households spend at least 50% of their income uh, on rent. LA has the highest poverty rate in our nation at 26%. One, so one out of every four households are living below the poverty level. And LA County is home to um, five of the 10 most uh, overcrowded zip codes, uh, including the number one overcrowded zip code in the US. At the same time, we've lost some 27,000 affordable rent controlled, uh, affordable housing units due to the Ellis Act, which is another law we have to get rid of, which allows landlords to go out of the rental business, evict and convert. And between 2001 and 2015, while rents grew in LA at 32%, the real income uh, adjusted for inflation dropped 3%. So for people living in here in LA, you, you would need about $110,000 annual income to secure an average uh, two bedroom apartment. If you're a minimum wage worker, you need about four or five, six minimum wage jobs to afford the rent. At the same time, we're in need of a half a million uh, new affordable housing. And the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has made things so much worse in LA. For over 10% of adults under 65 are uninsured. And where California has over 745,000 uh, COVID cases and nearly 13,000 deaths, uh, almost two thirds of the households in greater Los Angeles area uh, have experienced earning declines over the past four months. And of course, that hits uh, communities of color the hardest. Uh, and so we're facing a 17.5% unemployment rate here. Um, and, and the hardest hit are, are a Latino and African American communities. Since 1978, I have and Coalition for Economic Survival has fought to oppose and then repeal the Costa Hawkins uh, Housing Act. This act handcuffs local governments from, from really addressing their local housing needs. And unfortunately, all we've seen are these Band-Aid measures when we truly need major surgery. We do need to build more housing, but we need to build affordable housing, not luxury housing. Um, because we're never gonna build our way out of our affordable housing crisis because the money doesn't exist to provide that affordable housing. We also need to preserve our existing affordable housing because if we lose the existing affordable housing, it's not going to be replaced. And Proposition 21 is a key way to ensure the preservation of our existing affordable housing. That's why we all need to do everything and anything to ensure that this proposition passes in November because you know the landlords are gonna be out there with millions and millions of dollars to confuse and distort the issue. Uh, but we have the people, we have the renters, uh, we have the support of the Democratic Party and we need to ensure that Prop 21 passes. Thank you so much, Larry. So um, I, as I mentioned before, you know, what we're looking at here in California and in Los Angeles and San Francisco and really this affects 
every part of the state of California is mass evictions um, if something doesn't happen quickly. So my first question to the panelists um, is, given the fact that we don't have local control right now, um, what, given the fact that we have COVID, I should say, given the fact that um, a lot of people right now um, have lost their jobs, millions of people have lost their jobs, they can't put food on the table, people living paycheck to paycheck, um, the, the problem is that when that paycheck stops coming, like now, what happened? So I just want to um, throw out there, like, why do we need Prop 21 now? And what, you know, what really is the problem with the fact that we don't have local control? Well, uh, a, a couple of things. One is, again, these are extraordinary times. Now, obviously, pre-COVID, pre-coronavirus, uh, we had a, a huge issue with regards to housing, keeping folks under a roof and also a, a supply issue with regards to, as Larry just mentioned, affordability, um, workforce housing, housing for our low-income families, housing for our unhoused community members, not so much an oversupply of, of luxury units, uh, which are, are an oversupply right now, because uh, inflation has not met with the salaries that our working families uh, uh, had previous to COVID-19. Now in COVID-19, historic unemployment and underemployment, uh, especially for people of color, especially for Latinos, immigrants, African-Americans, but especially if you're undocumented immigrant, by the way, you're not receiving any unemployment dollars. You're not receiving uh, any dollars from the federal government, whether it's uh, the CARES Act or the HEROES Act, precisely because you're undocumented. So even if we have, for example, even if we have, for example, uh, eviction moratoriums, which is a short lease on life, if you will. Um, when that rent is due, four, five, six, eight months accumulated, if you don't have the ability because of coronavirus to uh, earn a living, how are you gonna pay the back rent? And that's why you have so many working families at the lowest economic strata at risk living on the streets. But I want to put this in context also, too, because one thing is really critical to understand about Prop 21, and that's why I come in through this perspective also, various perspectives, but as a former leader of the California State Senate, your state Senate, and you give me the opportunity to be your leader leading uh, the most progressive body in America, the California State Senate, is because there was one man, one individual, for 12 years consecutively, who single-handedly stopped any version of Costa Hawkins. And that was then one of my predecessors, David Roberti. For 12 consecutive years, this one man stopped any versions of Costa Hawkins. But if we go back into the 1990s, 1990s was a very dark, difficult decade for many Californians, but especially people of color. You had Prop 187 in 1994. You had Prop 209, eliminating affirmative action. You have Prop 227, eliminating bilingual education. Three ballot initiatives that largely impacted people of color. But you also had in 1995, the passage of Costa Hawkins, which impacts people of color, primarily in the state of California. And that's when David Roberti was termed out. So the evictions, this tsunami due to a global pandemic impacts everybody but disproportionately impacts people of color. And that's why if we're gonna advocate for criminal justice, environmental justice, climate change justice, if we're gonna advocate for human and civil rights and immigration reform, our most primal need as human beings is food and shelter. If we have no food, we die. And if we have no shelter, a roof over our head, a roof for our children, that we're living on the streets. And therefore, you can't advocate for anything else because you need a roof over your head. And that's what Prop 21 does. Prop 21 gives local officials up and down the city of California the option. And it's democratic because it's not a one-size-fits-all. It is not a uniform application coming in from Sacramento that says, by the way, even if you have a majority of city council members and mayors who want to do rent control, you can't do it, period, because Casa Hawkins doesn't allow you to do it. So it's about democracy. 
It's about transparency. It's about allowing elected officials such as David Rue and others throughout the state of California and individual mayors to say, this is what we need for our own community, for our own city. And that's why we need this more than ever with a global pandemic, with so many people at risk. Just in California alone, by the way, by the end of this year, thankfully we got a short reprieve on the eviction moratorium, but it was forecasted that four to five million people would be living on the streets. In LA County alone, it is specifically in LA County, 365,000 people at risk of living on the streets. If we're having a hard time as it is, dealing with 150,000 homeless individuals and family members today, how are we going to handle millions of folks who will be living on the streets in the immediate future? And these are working families. And that's why we need Prop 21 now. David, um, if you could jump in here and explain sort of your experience as a council member, like when you were trying to prevent rent increases on COVID impacted tenants, and how that happened, and then what, what, what is your experience when tenants come to you and say, hey, I've lost my job, I can't pay the rent, what is the council going to do? So we could sort of explain that experience, because I think you, you are in a very unique position to explain like what that looks like. Thank you, Susie. And you know, I, I can't wait till uh, uh, Kevin DeLeon comes into the council, because we definitely need his vote. <laughs> we need that extra vote, because let me tell you, you know, thank God for current rent control policies. If you live in a rent stabilized apartment, a rent stabilized unit, your rents could only go up about two to 5% a year. However, I think we could all agree during this extraordinary time of pandemic, no rent should go up. And that's what we try to do on the city council. And I try to lead on that. I mean, we did the eviction moratorium where we're, we're pushing the envelope in the city of LA, but the simple idea, of freezing rents during this pandemic when people have lost their jobs, people can't even pay rent to begin with. It's such a no brainer, simple idea, but because of Costa Hawkins, Costa Hawkins says rent stabilized ordinance only applies to buildings on arbitrary year of 1978. So we were able to push, 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 and we got a rent freeze on all buildings that are rent stabilized uh, ordinance under 1978. But any building that's 1979 or newer were exempt. Why was it exempt? Costa Hawkins. Because of this law, our city attorney and city attorneys all across, all across the state said that you cannot freeze rents on non-rent stabilized units. I think that's a bunch of BS because now is the time when we need to do it. And I, we wrote letters to urge the governor, urge the uh, state assembly and the state senate to relax Costa Hawkins but it fell on deaf ears. This is why we need to make sure that we uh, repeal and replace um, Costa Hawkins and put Prop 21 in place. Um, that's the main thing. And, you know, and, and, and literally, um, I mean, you would think what landlord in their right mind would try to increase people's rents? Um, you know, for the most part, um, luckily in Council District 4, I can't speak for the rest of the city, many of the property owners were following the law and were not increasing rent, but there were lots of unscrupulous property owners as well, trying to take advantage of the system. You know, if you lived in a 1979 building, they didn't care less, they increased rent, um, not just by 3%, by whatever they wanted to. Um, you know, and we did, even though we did, we passed laws like the eviction moratorium, People were trying to prey on those who did not know that this law was in effect, especially those who are maybe seniors, those who are maybe uh, non-English proficient, and threatened them with letters that said, you must sign this contract, you must pay your rent. I had one landlord that literally said, when you get your federal stimulus pay, uh, a check from the federal government, the first thing you must pay is your rent. Not buy food, not take care of hospital bills, not take care of the water or power bill. It's literally, you must pay me rent. That, that not only is that illegal, but that's just immoral. And this is what we have to deal with, what I have to deal with as a council member to stop these unscrupulous um, landlords from doing so. But what Prop 21 will do is do the most simplest of facts, allow the city council. It does not make it for the entire state of California where you could do rent control policies, but it allows local jurisdictions like LA to go to pass a rent freeze beyond 1978. 
um, and, and, and even do a temporary rent freeze during this extraordinary time of coronavirus pandemic. Thank you so much, David. Um, so, I mean, I think this kind of is the point, which is that we as Democrats need to be able to help those who are most vulnerable. Um, and I kind of feel as a Democrat, that's, you know, really our mission. And, um, you know, when our, you know, in order to do that, we really need our local elected officials to be able to take action. I mean, they're on the ground. They're the ones who are close to the constituents. They're like the first stop for most constituents. They're gonna to go to a council member or county supervisor. And right now, you know, they're just, they just cannot do that. Or at least their cities and counties um, can't take action in a way that will help them in any meaningful way. And so, you know, we have been in this like constant struggle um, to have the courts weigh in, to have the governor weigh in, to have the legislature weigh in. Um, whereas if we didn't have Casa Hawkins, people would actually be able to go uh, to their council members and their county supervisors. Um, Taisha, I'm going to ask you actually, because you um, have a unique perspective as both a homeowner and a landlord and somebody who is supporting Proposition 21, um, but also to see like what the impact is um, on people of color and communities of color um, regarding like high rent raises um, and like on individuals, right? That's one thing. But also when a unit becomes vacant and that vacant unit goes up to market rate, what that means for the whole community. Because we see like a lot of gentrification. We've seen this, you know, um, maybe more extreme in San Francisco uh, where the black population has fallen um, to like 6% of the, that population. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Thank you so much. Um, I think that uh, what has happened in California is uh, many black people have starved to leave um, because they can't afford it. And it's a direct correlation with the fact that they can't even find a job um, or someone gets sick in the family or there's one emergency and they can't pay the rent because they have to take care of the emergency and then they become homeless or they move in with the family member and that's only gonna last so long. So we're seeing a migration of black people moving to Texas, Arizona, um, uh, there was one other place and I, I can't think of it, but it's like a migration because they cannot afford to live here. And the ones that choose to stay, either you have two or three families living in one house or you have people out on the street and many of them are on the street. I know people, specifically African-American people, black people that are living in their car and getting up and going to work still, sleeping in the car and then going to work just to be able to put gas in the car and to be able to buy food. Um, and it's, it's really, really, really a sad situation. Um, I think about 10 years ago is when you start seeing uh, Blacks move out of LA. LA used to have a large population of Black people. And now when you go to LA, you will see most of them in uh, the encampment downtown, um, Skid Row. Um, it's a large majority of, of Black people and it's, really unfair um, in many ways. And I think that as a, a landlord myself, um, I certainly want my tenant to pay their rent on time, but I also make sure that I have the funds just in case something like this happens and they're not able to, to pay the rent. And I'm more lenient and more understanding, um, but that's me, just one person. You have many landlords that are not like that. I know people within the Democratic Party that do not believe in Prop 21 because they own property and they don't want to fall behind. And I understand that, but I think at this moment, we have, have to have empathy for people and understand people are really seriously struggling to where you have homes where the mother and the father both are unemployed. They're having to go to food banks to get food to feed their families. And if they have a mortgage, luckily we do have in place the, um, the mortgage uh, protections where people are able to put their mortgage off till December and then uh, pay on the back end. And so I think as Democrats, as Californians that know that there are serious issues surrounding um, homelessness, um, we have to get more involved and understand uh, this or it's going to continue to grow. And people think it might just be in downtown areas and things like that, but it's starting to move over into communities. 
And we want to help our brothers and sisters that are out there that can't do for themselves. A lot of mental illness uh, surrounds these, these folks that are out there. So it has to be a surround type service um, that we offer to ensure that these people um, are back in society, living right, and have somewhere to lay their head and, um, at night and um, survive. And, and so many children are involved with this and it affects them going to school and um, just survival, period. So I'm really in this to ensure that I can help in any way I can. I've been involved with homeless, uh, working with the homeless for uh, three years now is something that's a passion of mine because I feel extremely blessed to um, own a home and um, be a landlord and be able to survive. And so I want to give back in every way I can. Susie, before we go on to your next question, we're getting a lot of questions from the, from the, the chat um, for people just to explain in explicit detail what the prop does. I was, I was actually going to address that. <laughs> Um, so, but first of all, I did want to say that Kevin DeLeon gave us a very important history lesson that we need to take uh, heed of uh, because it lays the groundwork for activism in the future. Uh, he mentioned former Senate uh, President Pro Tem David Roberti, who every housing and renters' rights activist today needs to know as one of the greatest um, renter heroes in the state legislature. As, as Kevin said, he almost single-handedly stopped Costa Hawkins from going through. One of the reasons that gave him motivation is that my organization, Coalition for Economic Survival, led the effort to win rent control in the city of Los Angeles and in West Hollywood. We actually created the city of West Hollywood to ensure rent control. It's the only city built on rent control. But both of these cities were in David Roberti's district. And so he had uh, a, an obligation, not that he needed one, to ensure that he fought for this law. Now, Prop 21, what it does is that it does three major things that handcuff local governments right now. So one of this, it would allow local governments to allow for uh, a limited vacancy de uh, control. So currently, uh, Costa Hawkins prevents any control of vacant units. So when a unit comes vacant, a landlord can raise the rent to market, and then the next person is under rent control. Well, that vacancy decontrol essentially puts a target, a bullseye, on the back of every rent control tenant, especially if they're a long-term low rent tenant who in the most part happen to be people of color and senior citizens on fixed incomes and, and disabled people because the landlord knows if they get that tenant out either legal or illegal means they can jack up the rents and that's who's the target the second thing that it does is that as as council member rue talked about in the city of los angeles our rent control is frozen at an October 1978 date because Costa Hawkins says that you have to, you cannot control future new construction after the date that the uh, rent control law went into effect, uh, if it was before 1975 uh, or if it was after 1995, um, it has to be that date. So, the city of Los Angeles and San Francisco and Santa Monica all are being penalized for having the foresight to put in rent control to protect their residents in the 1970s and thus they can move that date up. But if you passed a new law today, any city, that date would be 1995, meaning that all buildings built before 1995 can be under rent control. So in the city of Los Angeles, we have buildings that are 42 years old that the mortgage has been paid out and they're exempt from rent control. The third and, and, and important thing is that under uh, Costa Hawkins, you cannot control single family dwellings. 
and and most rent control laws uh, didn't do it because at the time it made sense it might have made sense if you were a small um, owner or retiree and you had another uh, single family dwelling you were renting out for for your uh, investment and and retirement funds um, people felt they shouldn't be rent controlled but since then uh, our single family market has been totally corrupted by Wall Street uh, due to the foreclosure crisis all these Wall Street entities like Blackstone and Invitation Homes have gobbled up these homes, primarily in low income communities of color like South LA or East LA, and they own hundreds and thousands of single family rentals and they're exempt. So what Prop 21 does is says, well, if you're a small owner and you have one unit uh, that you're renting out, you're exempt. But if you're a big corporate landlord who owns hundreds and thousands of units of single family dwelling, you should have those units uh, put under rent control. And that's why it's so crucial uh, to ensure that not only we protect our existing laws, but we are able to cover those uh, people who are in need that are not currently covered by rent control. Could I add real quickly to that, Susie? So, I want to just quickly, uh, because I've been seeing the chat and the questions. When we talk about a rent freeze, it's, this is very, very basic. We're not talking rent forgiveness or rent relief. We are talking about a freeze in the increase in rent. So for example, if you're paying $1,000 a month, if you live in a building that's older than 1978 today, you are considered living in a rent stabilized unit or, or RSO building. So basically your rent could only go up roughly 3%. So if the landlord wanted to raise your rent, now you would pay $1,030. However, if you're living in a building that's 1979 or newer, when your lease is up, and usually they do a one year lease, the landlord the, or the building owner could raise your rent by 100, 200, 500, $600, any amount that he or she wants. And that's what we're trying to stop. So this is not saying, I know a lot of people are talking about how are they going to pay their mortgage. This is not about rent forgiveness or rent uh, uh, relief. Uh, we, I actually have a program for that. But this is literally just the increase. So when we say rent freeze, it's the increase in rent. Right now, Costa Hawkins only allows cities like the city of LA to restrict how much rent could be raised for buildings that are older than 1978. If Prop 21 passes, there's three big things that Larry talked about, but the biggest thing is now cities could determine at what, well, actually Prop 21 will say from 15 years from today, so it's 2020. So any building that was built uh, before 2005 will be under that same rent RSO restriction of 3%. So that's what we're saying. So when it becomes 2021, then it will be 2006. 2022, on and on and on. So that is the most important thing. And of course, I do want to reiterate what Larry talked about vacancy decontrol. Because when Larry says they're putting a target on your back, landlords want to do whatever possible. If there's a senior citizen who's been living in the apartment for 30, 40 years, they're probably still paying $1,000 rent or even $700 rent on a one bedroom when the surrounding neighborhood is now paying 15, 16, $1,800. So it is in the interest of that landlord to get rid of that, that long-term tenant as quick in any means possible so that person could, now they could charge $1,500 rent instead of $700 rent. If Prop 21 passes, it would say, even if that person at $700 moved out, there would be some restrictions where they can't jack up the rent to $1,500 overnight. Um, so that is what vacancy decontrol is, which is also extremely important. Because just imagine if you're one of the tenants, few tenants living in your old building uh, that's paying half the rent or two thirds the rent of every, everybody else, the landlord's going to want to try to evict you. And that's not right, especially during this time of COVID, COVID and coronavirus pandemic. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So just to recap for everyone who's watching, prevent homelessness and is an anti-gentrification initiative establishes local control for rental assistance that is not there right now, provides a 15-year exemption for new construction. So for the first 15 years that a unit is online, it won't be subjected to my control. Um, provides for 5% over three years 
increase in rent um, maximum for vacant units. And then it doesn't affect um, you know, corporate landlords for the most part and uh, these kind of large equity firms that have been um, buying up neighborhoods and raising the rent um, on entire neighborhoods and pushing out family. Um, so I want to thank our panelists. We're going to move on to questions, I think, from the audience if we stay on. Um, I do want to just say there's like four things that we would like you to do um, if you're watching and you're supporting Proposition 21. We'd like you to tweet out your support for Proposition 21. Um, please also go to Facebook and you can find our frame that says Yes on Prop 21. Um, and just look for Yes on Prop 21 and the frame will come up and uh, it'll walk you through sort of how to uh, do that. And then we have um, phone banking and texting and anything that you can do to help us reach out to voters would be great. So you'll go to Yes on 21ca.org, and I think that's in the chat. I'm gonna put that in the chat. Um, and then finally, one of the most important things you can do is tell your family, friends, um, fellow Democrats, please, um, you know, just spread the word because a lot of people, you know, as Democrats and people who are politically involved, they'll be coming to you and asking you uh, for what you think uh, are the best recommendations here. Um, you know, I want to thank the California Democratic Party so much for endorsing this initiative. That has brought so much to this campaign. Um, the CDP staff is, has been fantastic, um, particularly for this prop talk. Um, Rusty, Vince, India, um, Emma, um, you guys have been fantastic. And um, I think we can move on now to the questions. So I just want to make sure I got that in before we, before we move on. Susie, I want to say one thing real quick. This is Taisha. Um, I want to say to all those people that may be involved with uh, NAACP, BayPAC, um, Urban League, any of those organizations that sometimes those organizations do not have our best interests at heart. And so really do the research. What Emma put in the chat box, I click on that link and I'd read it for, um, read it for yourself so you understand it. But there are organizations out there that are supposed to have the best interests of African Americans um, or black people at heart, but they don't. And so if you see one of those organizations that say no on this proposition, I ask that you please reach out to one of us to ask more questions and please do your own research about the proposition so you will be informed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And just to be clear, uh, Urban League has in, endorsed Proposition 21, so it's um, Ask Me California People, SEIU California, Unite Here. Um, obviously, you heard from Pam Leon and David Rue, um, and Cal uh, Coalition for Economic Survival. Um, the uh, Black Caucus uh, for the California Democratic Party has endorsed the Renters Caucus, or Council now. Um, so we have um, fantastic endorsements of Dolores Pearsa, um, Congress members are really and Matthew Modern. Um, so we have a lot of a, a, a lot of great support. We're feeling the love, <laughs> and we're developing this fantastic coalition. Um, and Vince, do you want to um, grab a couple of questions off the chat really quickly? Yes. And while we're so before that, we have a few minutes left. Um, every Thursday, the California Democratic Party is having phone banks. Um, where you will be um, calling in support of Prop 21, as well as Prop 15 and 16. So if you, in the chat, um, Emma's put a, a link in the chat where you can sign up every Thursday um, to join us for phone banking to spread the word about um, why you and we support Prop 21. Um, so let's do um, a few questions very quickly. One um, question is, let's say I think this might be quick, Will Prop 21 reach all of California or certain areas? That will be contingent on the action of local government officials. Uh, therefore, city mayors, as well as council members, as well as city managers, have the opportunity to move forward with rental protections if, in fact, they wish to do so. So it's quite the opposite of Casa Hawkins, because Casa Hawkins said, we're taking away your ability, period, universal application. This does quite the opposite. It says you have that choice if you, in fact you wish to act upon it to protect and defend your constituents. 
there's a question about um, how does Prop 21 address change of ownership of a rental? Um, does it address that issue? Larry, do you want to take that? Oh, sorry, my video is working. So it doesn't directly impact um, the change of ownership. The rent, the local rent control law does. So, for instance, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, if you're protected by rent control and there's a change of ownership, that new owner assumes all the responsibilities under the law to the tenants and the tenants maintain their protections under the rent control law. Um, and Prop 21 doesn't impact that at all. Um, and it, it's, Hello. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so the ownership issue is really a a local jurisdiction issue under the existing law of that particular jurisdiction. And I think this probably probably a time for two more questions. One question is, how much is this going to cost? Who will pay for this? Okay. Um. So, if you guys could start my video, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so. Only you can start. We want to say that um, Council Member Rue and also um, Kevin DeLeon um, have, I think, a fairly hard out at 7 o'clock. So I definitely want to thank them for joining the panel if they have to leave. Um, and I hope everyone um, has learned a lot from them. Um, so I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Um, what is the what is the bill cost? And what is the proposition cost? And who's going to pay for it? OK, so the proposition doesn't cost money. <laughs> what it does is just allow local government to um, establish control for over uh, renter protection. Um, and in fact, um, it actually saves money, <laughs> to be clear. Um, so we are right now spending $35,000 to $45,000 per person that's homeless annually. Um, that's like way over a billion dollars. Um, and if we keep adding to our uh, homeless population, we're going to be paying even more. Um, and that's over above what we would spend if we provided permanent supportive housing. So in other words, the more people who um, don't have renter assistance and because of that fall into homelessness, um, because they can't afford the rent any longer um, or there aren't any uh, protections for them locally, um, the more money that we're going to spend as taxpayers. So um, as part of our ballot argument, you'll see that it saves taxpayer money. It explains how it does that. Um, but, but basically, it's because um, it costs so much to service our homeless population. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason that, um, you know, I helped to draft SB 1380, which was authored by Holly Mitchell, um, was because, you know, the, the reason that I was able to get governor to sign that actually is because uh, it was a fiscal bill and saved money, and this bill as well. Thank you. So unfortunately, we're out of time for right now, but we will definitely thank you, Susie, for putting this great panel together. And um, we hope everyone was able to get a lot of information about why Prop 21 is so important. Um, make sure you join us on Thursday nights um, to be able to call voters at the end of the day. You can, the thing that wins elections is talking to voters to make sure that they go out and vote and make sure you vote by mail. Next Wednesday, our next prop talk. Um, we have them all Wednesday this month. Um, and on the 20th of September, we have our day of action. Um, we'll be talking about a number of propositions and campaigns, and we'll be doing another one of our vote by mail truth squad trainings. So please make sure you register for the next prop talk. It's on Prop 17, 20, and 25, and on the day of action on September 20th. So thank everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Make sure you vote.